Yeah. When filmmakers direct their own confessions. On the evening of Friday, October 3rd, 2008, a 911 call was made from an Edmonton, Alberta neighborhood by a couple that had been in the area. The call stated that at approximately 9.23 p.m., the couple was on a walk together when a man called out to them and was seen stumbling towards them asking for help. As the man approached them, the couple turned around and started walking away from him, telling dispatchers that they thought they could be in danger of being robbed or assaulted. As the couple turned back around to see where the man was, he was gone. When police arrived to the scene, they were unable to find the man that approached the couple, and since they couldn't identify who he was, the report was set aside. A week later, on October 10th, 2008, Johnny Altinger met a woman named Sheena on a popular dating website. He was a quiet man who moved to Edmonton in the late 90s where he studied at NAIT before taking a job in quality control at an oil field equipment manufacturer in Nisku, just south of Edmonton. He was an unmarried man who loved motorcycles, computers, New Age philosophy, and Elton John. On the same day they met, they planned to see each other for dinner that evening, and on the 10th of October, John made his way to Sheena's home in his red Mazda hatchback to a neighborhood just off of 40th Avenue, Northwest, in Edmonton, Alberta. Hours later, his friends were at a local bar waiting for him to show up, as they had planned to all meet there with him. Unfortunately, John never showed up, his friends assuming he was getting lucky that night. When he didn't show up to work the next day or make it to a family biking trip he had planned, his family and friends started getting worried. Only three days after John's disappearance, some of his friends and family received an email from him stating that he had just met a well-off woman named Jen and they were planning to vacation in Costa Rica at her winter home. This text prompted his family and friends to go to his home and figure out what was going on. After minutes of waiting and no answer, they broke inside to find out that Johnny wasn't home nor was there any signs of his personal belongings having been packed. They also found his suitcases and passport in the apartment. They then immediately went to the police and filed a missing persons report. Detective Bill Clark of the Edmonton Police Department. Let's fucking go! Ordered sweet green again today. This time, the fucking sauces are in, dude. Oh my god. Also, what a thumb. Oh my god, dude. Please, tell me a lie. Tell me the lie, the grossest lie ever told, that cop phrenology is fake. Go ahead. I'll wait. I'll wait for you to finish that lie, only to hit you in the face. One day, Chatter, you're going to have sexual intercourse, okay? I know you don't believe it right now. One day you will. I believe in you. Let's hope to God that, like, uh, your fiancé wife didn't lie to you about having like a thumb uncle or something and that the thumb genes don't pop up because you're gonna know you're gonna look at your baby you're gonna be like does this baby have a thumb head nancy did you lie to me what does your uncle do tell me right now what your uncle does and that's when you're gonna realize like oh my god oh my god my uncle literally is or my uncle in law is literally a cop and Nancy fucking lied to you, and now your son has thumb genes, dude. Thumb child. ...was assigned to the case. Bill collected some evidence from the report, including a text message Johnny had sent when he arrived at Sheena's, mentioning the address he was going to be at in case he needed a designated driver to take him home. The first thing Detective Clark did was find out who resided at the address. He learned that the homeowner didn't reside at the property, but was renting out the garage to a man named Mark Twitchell. Detective Clark then headed to the garage and was greeted by Mark, who then voluntarily went in for questioning. Hey Mark, now, uh, just to go through things, like I mentioned to you that I'm going to do a tape interview with you and stuff, there's my ID. Okay, so I'm Detective Mike Tabler, police service, and uh, I'm here to talk to you tonight because the fact that you happen to be the renter of a garage that has... Garage? Okay, bro. Canada, how about you stop making a fake language, okay? How about you stop? G my man said garage. Why is everyone from Canada XQC, dude? I feel like that's some shit XQC would have said, okay? Uh, oh, hello. Uh, seems like you were renting out the garage. Now, first of all, can you please state your name for me? Mark Twitchell. 
You just made that okay. up. That's not well, a real language. The question that we're, we're talking about tonight, uh, can you tell me the address of that place? 57. And when did you rent that garage? I began renting it. Stop. I can't take the rest of this video seriously if he keeps saying garage. Bro, out of all the... Bro, out of all the ways to say words, this is the funniest way to say, like, garage, garage, is the funniest way you can say garage. Garage. On September 1st. And you got the only key to, or was it one or two keys? Two keys. Okay. So you got two keys. Mm -hmm. Okay, and where are those keys now? Uh, you guys have the one that I had. Okay. And the other one, the last I heard of is with uh, one of my production assistants, Mike Young. Mike Young, okay. one of your production assistants. Yes. Okay. And he is an assistant to you, but he, he didn't rent the garage. It's yours. Right. right. Now, I understand that you're doing this with a company, and, and I understand you're filming and stuff like that there. Yeah. Okay. Now, what, what have you been filming there? Have you been filming every day, or what's been going on there? No, the, uh, well, most of my stuff is all pre-production. Uh, I knew that I was going to use it as a location for filming, so I started, I mean, basically I began looking for something that's suitable mm -hmm. uh, in, like, late August. Yeah. So I uh, found that garage, found that it was an ideal location, and we were great for what our purposes were, mm -hmm. and uh, rented it. The only time that we actually spent shooting in that place was the last weekend of September. The last weekend of September. Yeah. Okay. We had uh, an evening shoot on the Friday, and that was for a couple of hours actually at someone else's house downtown. We shot in our condo, and then all day Saturday is when we used the garage to film. Okay. So. So you. Uh, yeah. What type of film is it there, or uh, that you're shooting at this particular time? That you're talking about shooting at this, uh, like a. Uh, what sort of a film is it? It's a suspense thriller, actually. We did a, it's a short film. Uh, it's a total run time, but it'll be about eight or nine minutes. Okay. So, yeah. Suspense thriller? Right. Um, so just about three weeks since you, and that's the only filming that you've done. Have you been back there since that film? Yeah, a couple yeah. times. Yeah. When was that? Uh, let's see. I went back. Uh, I don't remember the exact date, but I went back uh, one time because we had like a table saw and a bunch of tools that were there, and uh, my guy. And then last Friday, last Friday was when I went there to just clean everything up, get the basic garbage out of there and stuff like that. There was still like a box of bottles and stuff like that, things that had been there previously went in the place that. It Never got around to getting rid of, uh -huh. but uh, just getting some stuff out of there. Um, that was when you say last Friday, do you mean the one just passed? And I mean, we're now in Sunday morning, right? Oh, uh, no, it was a week ago. A week ago, yeah. So, today being the 19th, it would have been like probably 12th. Today, yeah. Wait, no, today's the 19th, today's Sunday, right? Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. the Friday before this Friday. So, probably both the ten. Yeah. I mean, this is the fucking <laughs> saying too much technique. Mark just told the detective that the last time he was at the property was on the 10th of October, which was the same day that Johnny had a date and had been reported to have last been seen on. Yeah, this one's called the spill the beans yeah, technique. Yes, it was. Okay. So Friday the 10th, you go down there and clean the place up. Mm -hmm. And that's the last time you were there. One of my problems is always uh, I have issues with this. I have also issues with uh, remembering uh, tasks to do. So I live on lists. <laughs> I try to formulate lists. As long as I have a list and I can check things off as I'm doing them, I'm okay. okay. But, I mean, <laughs> so I need to stay organized and I'm a procrastinator and stuff like that. So, um, I did, I think I did drop off, and I, 
honestly, I don't remember if it was this past week or the week before it, but I remember dropping off some cleaning materials just for the next time when we were going to go in there because my intention again was to, sh to pitch this thing and get it into a TV series or a, a movie. And uh, the place is so inexpensive to rent, but I figured, you know what, for future episodes, that'd be great to have. So. Now, when's your next plan to shoot there? Oh, it's not decided yet. Not decided yeah. yet. It's still up in the so air. So there's no, nothing planned for that garage. No. You live in St. Albert. Yeah. You'd be concerned about dropping off a few cleaning supplies there at the garage when nobody else is there. Stop. Sometime between that weekend and it had to be done right away. Well, not necessarily right away. The way that I do it again, it's on a list. Garage. So I would have like a line, long list of line items of stuff that I'm getting done that day, and it just happened to be one of them. So it's like a stop okay. off, drop it off, then go. Now, what sort of cleaning supplies would you have at that place? Uh, paper towels, um, like skin cleaner, gloves, the usual stuff. Just because we deal with this. When you do anything that's involving uh, like suspense thrillers or anything like that, and you, you want to have something that looks like blood on screen, mm -hmm. you use this mix that's like a corn syrup with uh, food coloring in it, because mm -hmm. it, it looks really good on camera, and it has the right consistency. Oh, uh, what? Sticky as hell. It gets yeah. everywhere, and it's a nightmare. And last time, it got all over the chair, it got all over the floor. It's like ridiculous. Yeah. So, and uh, that was really my famous because then everybody's grabbing stuff and moving it over, and every time they do, they rub up against it. Yeah, that's why. That's why you know you have to get adequate cleaning supplies, like you would in a real murder. You know what I mean? <laughs> Obviously, I would never do that, but like, ha! Huh. But for the fake blood, I mean, ha! Huh, you would need like actual murder supplies if you were to do a real murder. You know, I gotta pee. Hold on. Sticky so just a matter of keeping that stuff off of there and clean. For the second time, Mark just inadvertently switched off topic completely. He goes from vaguely describing the cleaning products he had at the property to explaining why he would have cleaning products there without the detective even asking. Now, so you were doing quite a bit of that sort of stuff in the garage, yeah. that kind of shooting, uh, where there was like blood effect. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, so what, uh, what other supplies would you have there that would be needed for that kind of thing? What, uh, um, well, it depends what you mean by supplies, because there's supplies and props and a lot of other stuff. A lot of the stuff that's in the garage was there when I rented it. Uh, stuff that I got just for the shoot. Um, there was like this you know, kit full of uh, knives that we were going to do. We were going to do like a reveal shot. So we got like opening this kit and it looks all menacing and everything. And kind of put that into a, a montage. Uh, what else? Like the, the usual duct tape for, for the guy sitting in the chair, duct taping him up. Yeah. Uh, there's that stuff. Uh, the sword, obviously. Well, there's two swords. One that like looks all glorious and cute on camera. And oh no. It's just a stunt one. That's oh no. Stain resistant. We used to like dump all the syrup on and everything. Yeah. Bro, he just. Uh, some clothes, prop mask. This is, I think this is going to be the second episode that we watch on the murder train today where second person just admits it too. He's just like, yo, uh, I know how this looks like officer, but like, I didn't do a murder, but like I did all this stuff that I would use in a murder. You know, stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. No, it's uh, me. Uh, I'm just thinking about this. I mean, it's kind of odd that you're filming that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And we end up going to that garage because of a missing person yeah. who supposedly went there. That's really freaky too. And as soon as they called me on the phone, as soon as Maxwell called me and said that, you know, this is what's going on, I get this weird chill. Because yeah. it just doesn't sit right. So the first thing I start asking myself is who all knows about what we do there and what our schedule is like and stuff like that. And if we, we have a shooting schedule, and, and where would you have got these cleaning materials? Like, you sound like something kind of special. Where would you get that? Oh, it's like Home Depot or Home Depot or something like that. Yeah. Well, yeah. We either this really is regular cleaning. Yeah. We don't need to get that crazy. So. 
<laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I don't know what you were well, describing this stuff. Yeah, yeah, no, it's just like uh, usual stuff. We don't have anything special. Did you say you don't need anything that crazy? Like he's like, if I did it, like you don't need anything that crazy. Like, what? Why would you? Why would you just say that? Well, this stuff. Yeah, 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 no, it's just like uh, usual stuff. We don't have anything special. The garage is a dirty place anyway. We have no yeah. intention of putting anything cool in there. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, just whatever will get the sticky stuff off or that kind of thing. That's basically it. Something that if it's not going to sit there and smell up the place, you know, be better. So, now you've been told that we're looking for a missing man. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, have you been told to stay? Bro, his confidence, his alpha, alpha is fucking through the roof right now. My man is leaning into the table. But he's literally one with the table right now, bro. Look at this. Look at this. What is that, bro? He's literally just like, yeah, I did a murder. It was fucking cool, actually. What? What's up? In my garage. Oh, the weird looking for a missing man. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, have you been told his name? <laughs> no. Okay. The name is John. Okay. Altinger. A-L-T-I-N-G-E-R. Does that name ring a bell to you or mean anything to you? No. Never heard it before. No. He's nobody that you've been using as an actor or that maybe uh, Mike or Jason would have been in touch with? No, I don't think so. Um, I don't know if Mike or Jay know him, but nothing that in terms of casting or production crew or anything like that. No. No. Not, not a worker, not an employee you've heard about. No. No. Now, do you have any girls that are employed by you or that take part in anything, any of the setup or Often. anything? Yeah. yeah. We uh, had a really like a uh, great actress on this one that we worked with uh, that was, she came to the condo set on the Friday, uh, came up from Red Deer, named Katrina. Katrina. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And it, uh, that's the most recent. Mark just stated that they often had female cast in production, yet he only lists the first name Katrina as an example. If female cast members were often working with him, he'd likely name a few more than one first name, considering he addresses other members such as Mike Young with his first and last name. Okay, the indications we have, and we've got this through our investigations, and the address comes up, and the, the garage is described, and he actually says that he was there on that particular the particular day we're talking about is, that, is the, I think, the 15th. The 15th, okay. Now, and I may be mistaken, I may be mixing a couple of things up, but I think the 15th. And that's the day you're indicating that you were probably down there putting supplies there. Okay, yeah. Okay. But all white there or something. Yeah. Yeah. And it was in and around the same sort of time frame that you were there. You know, that he would have been there. Okay. Like in the afternoon. Really? Yeah. And he was supposed to go there and meet a girl. Who described the address and told her how to get there. Hmm. Now this is where he's met through uh, you know, an internet uh, site. Okay. Doesn't know her from before. Yeah. So he, of course, lets friends know. Oh, yeah. Right. right. <laughs> Sends it out to a few friends. All of a sudden, he disappears. Last known place was there. And that's where the cold trail goes. Cold waters. Could it be? So, okay, let me get this straight. Yeah. The okay, guy don't. who's missing yeah. shows up to my garage. Right. Hopefully he's not. Claims okay, now he's saying it too? Okay, <clears throat> so a lot of you fools don't understand. This is called the garage technique.
if you can get someone, if you say garage so many times that you basically get um, the person that you're interrogating to finally also start, start saying such a ridiculous thing, you can get them to admit anything. So this is the moment where the garage technique has basically completely fucking unfolded. It's working. It's absolutely working. The garage technique is working. Um, and this person is completely under, he's basically hypnotized by this cop. Who have been in it? Yeah, and talk to a guy. Talk this is actually not allowed in America, by the way. It's so powerful. It's so fucking powerful that America banned it, but Canada still continues to use it. It's very weird. Talk to another guy. Yeah, so now there's two of them. And then he leaves. Because the girl's up there. That he's supposedly... Right. Okay. okay. And then he talks to her on the phone. Wait, are I you not trolling? Of course I'm trolling. What the fuck? He talks to her on the phone if he gets a message from her. Or which way that one was. Okay. Okay. He somehow ends up communicating yeah. with her. And then... Go back. back to the garage to meet them. Okay. Hmm. All right. Now, does that sound like anything that you know about? Not at all. Does it sound like anything that could be related in any way to any movie sort of stuff you're doing? Or? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, I'm a... I'm the producer. I pretty much control all the elements. Yeah. So if there was anything like that, if somebody needs to borrow the place or whatever, then they would let me know. So they let you know. Um, they, or they yeah. ask or something like that. So yeah, no, I don't know anything about that. No. Mark is insinuating his complete innocence here by stating that if anything like that was planned for that garage by anyone, he would have known. This sort of statement is characterized as a blanket statement as what it reveals underneath is a lack of awareness that something could have happened that he didn't know about. Mark's response to this question is atypical when compared to his previous comments about being uncertain who had the keys between some of his production staff as well as him not knowing the day he was at the garage last. With the amount of uncertainty he's portraying, it's hard to believe that he can be sure that no one else he knew had something planned there. So once again, John Altenier is not a name you've known. You, nobody like that has tried to rent the place from you. Nobody by the name of Jim means anything to you. No. No relatives named Jim ever met? Oh, maybe. That's <laughs> over the list. Right. <laughs> All right. My mom's very well. <laughs> so, you know, I, let me get back to you on that one. It's a checker for sure. But <laughs> Yeah. Um, no. So, have you ever heard of these online dating sites, kind of things. What are some of the ones you've heard of? Oh man, I don't know. Match.com. Uh, I've heard of the Plenty of Fish one. Uh, okay, Plenty of Fish. Yeah, there's uh, what else is there? I don't know. There's a bunch of them, like hundreds of them. Yeah. So. Okay. So you don't frequent them? No. Uh, all right. Now, like I said, I'm going to talk to my people and see if I uh, miss them anything. Okay. And run over stuff. So bear with us a few minutes, and thank you very much. Uh, sure. Okay. Do you and we come back and I'm sleeping, just nudge me up. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Don't start swinging. Come on. Come on. Okay. I'm a winner. Oh, okay. <laughs> what is it? Mark was then cleared following the interrogation. Oh. Detectives felt that he was honest and cooperative throughout the whole process. What? Mark even invited detectives to take a look through the garage, to which they did, and discovered nothing un What? ...unordinary through their search. After this, Mark was no longer the primary suspect in the disappearance of Johnny, and the police department felt they were back at the beginning. A few weeks later, a man named Gilles Tetrou walked into the Edmonton Sheriff's Office and told detectives a very compelling story that he claimed happened on October 3rd. He must have grabbed me, and um, we started struggling. Oh, and I'm guessing during this, 
Bro, turns out the garage technique was the opposite. And we've all been duped. It was actually the dude originally that started the garage. And he hypnotized the cop. This is a classic case. It's like cop kryptonite. That's when I'm like, okay, I got to try to fight. And that's something I missed, or actually. I tried punching him too, but I was so weak. And I'm, I remember trying to punch him. And I know I can't hit this mask because that's going to hurt my hands. So I'm trying to punch him in his chest. And I'm thinking, man, why am I so weak? And my punches aren't, I feel like I'm not doing anything. And it's like my punches are so weak. And then, uh, so I realized, okay, I'm punching him. I'm not going to do anything. He's way bigger than me. And I, I'm not, can't do anything. So then I started uh, trying to kick him in the f But I tried a few times doing that. Uh, Did you get him? No. Did you hit him? No. Couldn't. And did he hit you? No. What about kick you? Uh, he tried, but he, he, I, I swerved as well. So I like, is this an all intense battle, or is it like? No, that's the thing. Is like, this is the whole thing. This is what I'm thinking. While I'm doing this, this guy, he had, if he was more professional, he could have killed me right away. Like right when I walked in, I didn't see him. He could have hit me over the head with a. A bat, uh, a baton, or anything. What is going and on? He knocked me unconscious right away. And I, I don't know why he did that. His whole plan was to use this taser thing on me first. And I was stupid on his part. But he had many chances to kill me. He never did. So he had a... That's why I thought afterward all this happened. He had a bigger plan for me. I thought he maybe he was going to handcuff... This is a random dude reporting being attacked by someone who's, like, larger than him. And I guess the tie-in is going to be that, like, he was trying to frame him for murder. Yeah, he would take me somewhere and do something. So you're now... I think cops in fucking Edmonton literally just believe everything, though. Like, like the guy will come in and with, like, an unbelievable story, looking like fucking Germa. And cops are like, oh, you're probably right, my friend. Just like the other guy was like, well, you know, I have all of these murder weapons in my garage. And then the guy was like, all right, fine, sir. Well, you said you didn't do the murder, so uh, go right ahead. You know, they just you can just, like, go up to a cop and tell them anything, and they will believe you. Why is Jerma catching strays? Because, I mean, okay, well, it is Jerma. So. Trying to punch him, you feel weak. You're yeah. trying to kick him. You're not connecting. Yeah, that's when he goes, well, since you're not cooperating, this is the way it has to be now. And then he starts punching me in my left side of my face. And for some reason, again... It would have been more effective for him to punch me in the nose, the eyes, you know, something. Because if he'd punch me in the nose, I'd have been down, right? But he's punching the side of the head, trying to get my temple or knock me unconscious for some reason. I'm not sure, but probably about to struggle. Probably about to struggle with the guy. See, now this is for this is weird because I'm facing this way. He pulls the gun out again, and for some, I think because I. I grabbed the gun. Somehow we maneuvered. We were um, struggling again. And I'm trying to break the gun, right? So we're struggling. And somehow I ended up this way again, struggling with this gun. And he's here back at the door, okay? So because I yeah. just remember the. He's, he's backseat driving his fucking assault. Door being here. And I'm just trying to. Re Look, here's break how this he gun could have gotten me way better, don't you know? It's plastic, and I know if I. What's he doing? He, he's yelling at me because he doesn't want me touching his gun. And so then uh, I wouldn't let go, obviously. But And I had a hold of his arm, his other arm, just in case he tried to punch me in the left, but he never did. And so we're just struggling. I'm just, it, you could tell, it's just weird that because he, if he was a real gun, he would have fired it or whatnot. He never did. He had nothing, and he didn't, he, he never just wasn't professional it was just like it was maybe his first time that's how I what when Gilles gave them the address that the incident took place they found out it had happened at the garage that Mark had been renting although his story was entirely believable he was unable to identify the man who assaulted him officers then went and spoke to neighbors of Mark and when they interviewed a neighbor only a few houses down they found out they had seen a red hatchback in Mark's driveway once detectives heard about this, they asked- Are you fucking- Oh my god, dude. What are the cops doing? All they know is beating up indigenous protesters, bro. I swear to god.
Sorry. He's leaving a Yelp review for his assault. First of all, I'm going to be honest with you, but the dude, the first dude was ridiculous. But the second dude actually sounded like he was just making that shit up. The disturbing case of Jeremy Elbertson. This is one of the most extraordinary pieces of interrogation footage to ever reach the public domain. You wouldn't need to be an expert in body language to recognize the unmitigated terror emanating from the suspect's face at this moment. The suspect has morphed himself into this abnormal and extremely creepy character. I didn't fucking do anything. I didn't, I didn't do anything. Whether it's a strategy or some sort of mental breakdown is unclear. He appears completely void of human emotion. No regret, remorse, shame, nor fear. Yep. The segment of admission was cut, yet the JSO released the footage that came just moments after. It shows a human being experiencing an emotional reckoning so overwhelming, while also trying to process the terrifying nature of his immediate situation. <laughs> Dude, I love Jerma. King, what a king. Well, what was that? It's just a joke. Like, his, his fan base loves putting him in uh, green screen Jerma in, like, random footage. <clears throat> Ask There's a blood stain at 38. Once again. 24, and thank he you. He asked me, you know, hey, buddy, do you want to buy a car? And uh, I said, well, you know, I'm in a car. <laughs> like, uh, what do you mean? And uh, he goes, well, I have shacked up with this really rich lady. Uh, you know, it's like a sugar mama kind of situation. And she's going to take care of me. And she's going to buy me a new car when we get back from a vacation that we're going to take. I've never understood how more true crime heads aren't ardently anti-cop. Every story is full of cops fucking everything up. Honestly, I think part of it is because they're just... You know, because the cops are like the automatic good guys, even when they're fucking up in the story. Because like the guys that are going after in true crime stories are like successful murderers. You know what I mean? So those guys are the automatic bad guys. So then the people trying to catch them are the automatic good guys. You see what I'm saying? What's going on? Do you know? Or... Yeah, that's what I'm going to find out right now. Contacting the lawyer. That still holds true. Okay, just so you're aware. Okay. If at any time we're talking, you want to contact the lawyer, you can do so at any time. I'll take you to a phone. There's something else I want to tell you, Mark. And that's that there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that you're involved in the disappearance of John Altinger. Oh! Let's go, don't you know? No doubt in my mind at all, Mark. Why? <laughs> As I said, Mark, there's no doubt in my mind that you're involved in this disappearance. Oh, I just want to get... Dude, he is not a good actor. I don't know if he's a good... Uh, I don't know if he's good at, uh, you know... Directing, but or producing, but he is bad at acting. Get to the bottom of this, because this is not going to go away. It's not going to leave you, Mark. I don't understand. I'm going to explain some of the reasons to you. But you do understand, because you know what I'm talking about. You're also, this is literally like an insane way to react to that. Not the ch real quick, but like, ch you know what I'm saying? Like, not a single normal human being would be like, No! Lothario! Why have you forsaken me? Like, everyone would normally be like... Everyone would be like, what the fuck? No, shut the fuck up. You're insane. That's crazy. This guy's like, ah! Ah! You're involved in this, and unfortunately, something got carried away. Something got carried away with this guy. I mean, it, 
<laughs> also, wait, the cop came in super hot. Okay. He came in super hot. He's like, there's no doubt in my mind. And then when the guy was like, why? He's folding, dude. Are he said, I'm going to explain the reasons to you. understand because you know what I'm talking about. You're involved in this. And unfortunately, <laughs> something got carried away. What is that happening? Something got carried away with this guy. I mean, it, this happened because of, of the movie thing. Something Bro, this is the worst technique, dude. What the fuck? What is happening, dude? Oh, well, something got carried away, actually. What? Bro, bring Jim Smith in here, dude. Jiminy Smith needs to fucking make short work of this homie right here, okay? Whatever the cop is, it, the cop here is not doing a good job, okay? Oh, my God. I went too far. <laughs> He was like, I'm going to tell you exactly why I believe you. Like, I believe that you are involved in this. And then did not. And proceeded not to say anything. It was, this is called the bluff technique. Where you bluff and say you have evidence. And then you basically just admit you don't have evidence at all. By completely folding. This is a situation where I'm like, who's... I mean, this, do, this dude is like waiting to confess. And the cop is still fucking it up. Shut up, Midor Meepo. I have no idea what the hell is going on. You do have an idea. You have a very good idea, Mark, about what's going on. You know exactly what happened there that night. All I'm looking for is your side of the story. But the truth. Not what you've been telling me. That what you've been telling me hasn't been the truth. Has it, Mark? I love verified users. I love this pulling up verified user them. logs. What do you mean it can't be? I just don't understand. Bro, this is so bad. Okay. In every instance, in every instance, you're supposed to at least, like, fucking mention, like, here are the reasons, like, you were here on the day of, like, we can place you, like, here's the motivation, like, we can place you, you have no alibi, you have the fucking cleaning supplies, like, all this shit, and he's like, you know, you could have done a better job, yeah. Well, what don't you understand? You have a fellow who's missing. We know he's been to your garage. <laughs> We've talked to all the neighbors now. Garage! Neighbors watch. They see all these things. Little things that you don't realize. Okay? When you gave your version of events to Detective Tabler last night, your version of events was different than what you told me today. Notice the suspect's verbiage here. The detective states that Mark told a different series of events before today, although the only part of the story that Mark added was that he bought a red hatchback from a guy that turned out to be missing. The detective purposely does this to attempt to discredit the suspect's statements, as when one is told their story is a lie, anyone being truthful would instantly become confrontational. You've changed your whole story. All kinds of different lies. Now, I know this isn't an easy thing to live with. Something went wrong there. Like I said, I don't think you're a bad guy. You seem like a decent guy. You got a wife. You got a small child. You're trying to do the best. I don't think, you know, I don't know, but I don't think you're doing that well financially. I think it's a tough life what you're in. You're trying to do your best, but something went wrong. Maybe you're... Every time I watch true crime, I, I realize that like 90% of the time, if criminals don't fucking just like admit, this is how they get away, dude. And if this is how bad they are at interrogation, oh my God, how bad are they at like evidence gathering and all this other shit? No wonder so many fucking crimes don't ever get solved. You just got to rely, you got to rely on like the criminal being like, yeah, I kind of did it. Sorry. Yeah. 
Yeah, you guys didn't even catch me. You're not even near it, but I'm going to come ahead. I'm going to go ahead and admit that I did it. I did the murder. It was me. Officers, you can arrest me. It's fine. Otherwise, like, no shot, bro. They're fucked. We're just trying to make a better movie. I don't know. Something went wrong and you're involved. And this is not going to go away, Mark. This is going to keep on eating at you and eat and you feel like I'm in the fucking toilet zone right now. And why do you feel you're in the toilet zone? We need to get to the truth about what happened with John Altinger. You know very well that you don't buy a car that's worth over $10,000 from someone for $40. You know that. You know that you get a bill of sale. That part of your story is just, it's just lie after lie after lie. And it's time to end those lies, Mark. Not once do you mention a red car or buying a car off of an individual you didn't know for $40 while he's asking about the disappearance of a guy who's seen at your garage. <laughs> Wait, $40? <laughs> oh, man. I'm sorry, officer. I'm not going to fucking... I'm not going to... What, what am I, not going to take that deal? It's a deal of a lifetime. And my garage is right there. And it's obvious why you didn't mention it, because you had something to do with his disappearance. <laughs> also, 40 Canadians, so like $12. <laughs> I mean, you have, you have a barrel in your garage. A barrel you say you buy for garbage. Everyone knows in the movie industry, those are known as burn barrels. What? We got that off your own friends. They're the ones telling us this. Your co-workers. Wait, what does that mean? Like, so everyone in the movie industry is doing murders? Like, routinely? I don't understand. Oh, everyone knows. In the, those are burn barrels. Like, you know, when you murder someone, when you murder the best boy, you just toss them in the burn barrel. What the fuck? What you do with them? Oh, he's saying, no, it's the fact he didn't know what it was. Oh, 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 okay, got it. The episode of Casting Couch isn't what I expected. Good one, Midor Meepo. Hey, leave the jokes to me, okay? How about that? Mr. Uh, unpause. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That was funny. Good job. They're saying he's not actually doing film. Okay, I, I didn't understand that. He's a Dota YouTuber. I was just, I was, I'm just fucking around, man. Wrong tree. Wrong dream? No, tree. Wrong tree. Mm -hmm. And what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that, Mark? I'm done. You what? You're done. Oh my god, shut the fuck up. He's gonna admit it. Oh my god. Dude, what a fucking dummy, dude. I mean, I just, I'm not talking anymore. This is ridiculous. Well, what is your explanation? You haven't answered any of the questions. When someone being interrogated, this homie would not survive any of the lobbies. This dude is like out interrogated by, I mean, there's just no, he is basically, this is a war of attrition. And the only way big homie, the only way big homie fucking loses here, or I mean, the only way big homie gets a dub here is if, this dummy actually ends up admitting it. Crazy. Besides, they don't want to talk anymore. Before consulting with a lawyer, they have the complete right to remain silent. But with those rights in mind, detectives can continue to ask questions and make statements that can persuade the suspect to provide more information. If you didn't do anything wrong, why wouldn't you answer those questions? Do you know why, Mark? Both of you and I know the answer. Because you're involved. Good one. Top. You're involved over your head. In this. Is anything that you're saying genuine, or is this some sort of tactic? 
Good you question. gotta get away from the actor. Good question. Part, Mark, and listen to what I'm saying. You said you're a you bad actor. You told me nothing but lies. An innocent <clears throat> man does not come in here and tell lies. That's genuine, Mark. Everything I'm telling you in here is genuine. So get out of your film producer mode and the facade of thinking that everyone's an actor. Because this is real life. You conveniently can't remember where you were on the 14th of October. Nothing convenient about it. It's just actual fact. Despite anything that's been going on, I really cannot. You cannot what? Remember. Remember what? About the 14th. So you can't remember about the 14th. Why did you lie about the 15th? Am I being charged? Not yet. Am I free to go? Yep. Then I will. Okay. We're seizing your car. So you won't be getting it back. You'll be getting Dog, you got it for 40 bucks. Don't worry about it. What is happening right now, bro? We finally arrived at a criminal justice system dumber than the American one. What the fuck is going a on? Warrant. You go through the car, forensic examination. Okay? As soon as we're done interviewing everybody else, you will uh, we'll be coming back to charge you. It's just a matter of time. The detective brilliantly places a subconscious ultimatum of either proving his innocence now or being charged eventually. The detective is letting Mark know that if he does choose to walk away without talking, that he would eventually be caught anyway. All right. Do you have any questions about any of that? Bro, I feel like... The detective was so bad that the fucking guy is just like engaging in copium here to be like, it was brilliant. It's a brilliant move to be like, you can go away. Do you want to clear anything up now so I don't have to keep coming after you? Are you that cold a person, Mark, that you can live with this the rest of your life? Bro, he's literally at, like, he's, gr he's fucking trying to grab anything he can here. He just... Flinging shit at a wall, seeing what sticks. Oh, you're going to really live with that on your conscience? Doesn't bother you at all? What does that mean? Well, you're involved in this disappearance of this guy. Mm, but we'll live with it. What do you mean? Well, what you did to him. You can live with it. You fucked him over and you bought his car for $40. <laughs> That's what I mean. You can live with that. What's happened to him? I mean, only you know what's happened to him. I'll find that out eventually. Like, you're not a very good actor. And you're in the business. I've said I was an actor. Producer. You've seen actors. You're not good at it at all. What? Bro, even the entire premise of him being like, you're a bad actor, just got fucking un... Like... You just owned him, dude. At least let him go at this point, brother. You, you're not. And was this something that you tried to avoid and you just couldn't? He's just, he's just trying to hurt his feelings. And he's like, I'm not an actor, dummy. I'm a producer. What do you mean? Did he try something? You're just defending yourself? I don't know. You were the one that was. Okay, that right there is an out. Okay. What he's doing right there. We've seen time and time again. Because, you know, true crime fanatics here. We're, we're basically cop phrenologists. We're also criminal psychologists. And that is the first time he's actually done something good, which is throw him a lifeboat to say, hey, actually, maybe it was because you wanted to defend yourself. <sighs> yeah. A lifeboat, whatever, fucking life vest, life Pardon jacket. Me. I don't fucking know. It's a very weird, it's a really weird comment that you made. 
Pardon me? It's a very weird comment you made. Which comment is that? About what? I'm not trying to be the bad guy here, Mark. Can't help but feel like that's a tactic. I just feel like everything is a tactic right now. Why do you think that? Caught him! And you know what I've told you in this room is the truth. So how do you, how do you say that the tactic? I Got him. It is a tactic. He's right. You know, we're not seeing a movie, but it's a couple things. This is real life stuff. You gotta get away from the movies. Yeah, I know. That's the problem here. All I'm here for is get the truth. That's my job. There's two sides to every story. I know, I know why. No idea. John went to the garage. Garage. I know a little bit about his background and what he's into. Not very pretty. Does that mean? Well, I'm not going to go into all that because that's that's not the stuff that you need to know. But let's just say he's got some skeletons in his closet. And I know that he could have done something there to, to provoke things. To cause trouble. And if he did, and something happened because of his provoking or provocation there, then what I'm telling you is this is your chance to get it out. What are your advices for newcomers of the United what? States? Uh, don't talk yeah, to the cops. Uh, oh, I need some time. I need to be able to sleep. This isn't going to go away while you sleep, Mark. I know. That's the problem. It's time for you to step up to the plate. Tell me what happened to John. Tell me where he is. Bro, he literally fucking... He bored him into a confession, I think, at the end. Because I suspect the confession is coming, right? It has to. And if it does, at the end, it's just literally like... He, he, won, this, he won this round by just exhausting him until he was like, all right, fuck it. I don't know, man. You ain't giving the cops enough credit. This dude was told he could leave 30 minutes ago. He's still sitting there. Dude, that's what I'm saying. No, that's literally what I'm saying. Like, this guy's a dumbass. He's, he's basically fucking... <laughs> he's basically just on his own volition They're totally fucking this up so we can do the decent thing and not only for him but for his family and for your own well-being you're not going to be able to live with yourself with this for the rest of your life Yes, is it chatter correctly? Oh, okay, dude. I mean, come on, bro. He's just like, maybe he thought kind of like porn. You know, if you film it, then a murder is is legal. You know what I mean? If you if you if you don't film the porn, it's prostitution. But if you film it, it's pornography protected by the First Amendment. So maybe he thought it was like he could get away with it because I filmed it. You know. But also. I mean, he's, he literally keeps telling. He, he thinks he's a fucking anime villain, dude. Look at him. You'd be surprised with what I could live with. Mark was released following the interrogation with his vehicle seized for the forensics team to examine. Detectives then decided to take Mark back to the garage. Right, there's, uh... See that? Take a look at those windows right there. See how easy it is for the neighbor to see who's doing it? See that? See that there? Beautiful view coming from the neighbor's house, either side. Let's see who's doing this. Too easy. Motherfucker, it was too easy. Why'd you release him twice? It clear clearly it wasn't that easy. Obviously, it was not that easy. You know? You lit what? Oh, too easy. That's why we release you twice into the wild. So you could have ample time to run away. Way too easy, Mark. Bring back any memories? You want to tell us where the body is now? We can get this over with? Get you back to the station? Bro, this is, this is Trailer Park Boys, dude. I've never watched it, and that's why you guys are making fun of me by 
basically showing me Trailer Park Boys. Uh, and, and I was too stupid to think that this was a real murder case. I got it. It's fine. It's just, you're, you're doing that right now, right? That's what's going on. No, this is like the Canadian Reno 911, right? No shot. Less than 24 no hours later, shot, forensics dude. found the blood of John Altinger in the trunk of Mark's car. Detectives then drove to his home and arrested him on October 31st, 2008, charging him with first-degree murder. Before driving Mark directly to the police station, they decided to take him on a drive around, hoping to get him to confess where he dumped the body. I mean, let's look at this realistically, Mark. You will be able to sit in jail while you're serving your time and write this whole thing out. And when you get out, because it'll happen, what are you now? 28? 29. 29? You'll still be able to uh, be young enough to write a movie about this. This could be your ticket, and it'd be a movie about yourself based on a true life story. Hey, Mark, are we beating a dead horse here, or are you going to tell us where the body is? Simple question, Mark. Can't you answer that? I think we've been pretty decent with you. You can g at least give us an answer on that. Our investigation is impeccable. Our evidence, <laughs> evidence is flawless. Evidence speaks for itself, as I said. What? The only piece of the puzzle that's missing is returning Johnny Altinger to his family. The decent thing to do. All we're saying is you can end the story and just satisfy the family. And we're just trying to do our jobs. But with or without the body, I have no doubt in my mind, no doubt whatsoever, that you will be convicted of first degree murder. Minimum 25 years, no chance of parole. What do you think about Mark? I'm curious. What does a man think about who's on his last ride in the city? Facing a type of sentence you're facing. What does he think about? You can put those thoughts down for your movie or your book. Bro, this video, I keep looking at the time. You know when you're like watching a movie? And you keep looking at like, wait a minute, like, this is weird. Like, how is this going to end? Like, how is this going to finalize in the last four minutes? Am I missing something here? Your diary. What were you thinking about this whole ride? What's interesting, we pull up to all these people today beside red lights, and they have no idea what you've just done. That you're the guy that wanted to be a serial killer, but got caught on his first kill. No idea. Kind of ironic. So I gotta thank you for that, Mark. Appreciate you uh, giving us the best case we've ever worked on. Appreciate you making nothing but bumbling errors to make it actually quite easy to catch you. Very easy to catch you. Damn, someone just said the level of patience can only come from a cat owner. That's a self report. I wanna thank you for that. I mean that sincerely. I'm not trying to be joked around it, but it's just so funny. It's you can't help but laugh about it. While unable to get a confession of what Mark did to John, <laughs> police were able to execute a search warrant on Mark's garage with the Bro, what the fuck? They literally just fucking dude, yeah, you, you know why they weren't able to get a confession, dude? Because that was the worst confession I've ever seen. That was the worst interrogation of all time. He was just talking shit. It's like he tilt. He got tilted. Like he couldn't get anything out of him. He didn't even try. And then when he just was like, "Ah, oh, fuck it, I can't do it." Yolo. I'm just gonna unload. Maybe I'll like trigger him into fucking confessing it. This is the second clickbait when the filmmaker directs oral confession. What the fuck? The evidence found in his car. At first, officers found nothing until a chemical called luminol was sprayed on the floor. Luminol reacts with the iron found in the hemoglobin of blood, causing a blue glow indicating cleaned up blood stains they had not seen previously. Officers then oh, executed a search warrant on his my home, God. and in the basement they found a hockey mask similar to the one Gilles described seeing. They also found and seized Mark's laptop, and what investigators found on it shocked them. After recovering some deleted files, they found a document titled SK Confessions, which- STOP! Are you fucking kidding me? This entire time? This entire time, he had already written the fucking confession? Bro, this is literally 
The d oh my god, these cops are so fucking dumb. This guy wanted to literally write their. He, he wanted to let it out so hard. Stood for serial killer confessions. The opening lines of the document was the following. This story is based on true events. The names and events were altered slightly to protect the guilty. This is the story of my progression into becoming a serial killer. This document presented Mark's plan. Details about it. Wait. Like anyone just starting out a new skill, I had a bit of a trial and error in the beginning of my misadventures. Allow me to start from the beginning and I think you'll see what I mean. I don't remember the exact place and time it was that I decided to become a serial killer, but I remember the sensation that hit me when I committed to the decision. It was a rush of pure euphoria. I felt lighter, less stressed, if you will, at my freedom of the prospect. There was something about urgently exploring my dark side. It greatly appalled. It greatly appealed to me, and I'm such a methodical planner and thinker. Yeah, guess what, dude? Not, not so much. Bro, this guy literally thought. This guy thought. Like writing, uh, you know, under the copyright claims, like the the content. I don't own the content. You know, under like totally fucking ripped TV shows will save you. Like that's what he thought. He thought like, oh, it's based on true events. Names are slightly altered to protect the guilty. I'm a murderer. I love doing murders. I've I fucking I. It's my favorite hobby is doing murders. You know, and then <laughs> what? Like people were gonna read it and go, oh fuck. We could have fucking had him, boys. <laughs> we could have had him, but guess what? Like, oh no. <laughs> oh shit, dude. <laughs> yeah, he's XQC my boo boo. Like, when XQC my boo boo writes, like, this is not stolen. Uh, you know, this is not copyrighted material, I promise. Or I don't own the copyright. You know? Progression into becoming a serial killer. This document presented Mark's plan, details about his failed first attempt with Jiu, and successful second attempt to lure a man to his garage and murder him with fake online dating profiles used as bait. It went on to describe the process of dismembering the body and attempts to dispose of the remains. He attempted to dispose of the body by wrapping parts in plastic and burning them in a burn barrel. However, once he was unable to do so, he drove the remains to a sewer where he dumped them. Mark's trial was set for March 16, 2011. Prosecutor Lawrence Van Dyke told jurors in his opening address that Mark Twitchell's plan was quite simply and shockingly to gain the experience of killing another human being. In the half-hour address, Van Dyke presented the jury with a transcript found on his laptop that showed Mark's intention to release a movie titled House of Cards, which revolved around a killer who lures a man to a garage on the premise of an internet date and kills him. In Van Dyke's closing statement, he informed the jury that Mark killed Johnny Altinger by bludgeoning and stabbing him to death. Mark confessed to the murder of Johnny and acknowledged having authored the document recovered from his machine. Bro, this dude is so original, he literally took, he stole the name of like pre-existing IP. That's awesome. I mean, he was just bad across the board in every way, dude. Meanwhile, Kevin Spacey allegedly doing more than this dude but claimed the murder was an act of self-defense. He claimed the document- Oh, this was in 2011, you pepega? Okay, bro, I didn't know. Give me a goddamn break. Okay, well, my bad. Okay, maybe, maybe Kevin Spacey stole this from him, okay? God damn, everyone is so mad. I've been, because I've been ripping into Canada so hard. I've been ripping into Canada so fucking hard. Wait, what, they said it? House of Cards must have been an IP before the TV show? Yeah, I mean, uh, apparently it was a book already, and there was a British version of it. Everyone just jumped down my fucking throat to be like, you fucking idiot. It was purely fictional, but was based in Canada. We're still going to invade you. OK, I'm going to let you know the invasion is imminent on what the facts would be if he had actually planned John's murder. He insisted that he had written. My bad. I didn't know. Two seconds after the video later says 2011. No, I mean, like, I didn't know the fucking House of Cards uh, was 2013. I'm sorry that I don't know when House of Cards in America came out. I'm sorry. I will do a YouTube video apologizing. It was a joke. It was a joke. I was joking. Written it to craft an authentic sounding story. Mark was convicted of first degree murder and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for at least 25 years. So, okay, let me get this straight. Yeah. The guy who's missing. Yeah. Shows up. My garage. Right. 
I mean, even he made fun of the garage thing. In, me in loving memory of Johnny Altinger, poor guy. Oh, man. All right, well, 